Hello, and great day everyone. It is May 5th, 2011, and this is Tanya and Beth from Wash Your Brain, and we are fortunate to have Professor Griff with us today. He may be best known as the Minister of Information from Public Enemy, as well as a spoken word artist and talented musician. He's been a major instrument in the truth movement and in exposing the Illuminati. He's also an author whose most recent book is called Analytics, and he continues to lecture across the globe, educating people on the metaphysical goddessry of the soul of hip-hop. Welcome, Griff. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? I'm all right, and thank you for the welcome and the warm introduction there. Absolutely. Griff, we're so glad to have you with us. Could you tell us a bit about what you're currently working on? Um, right now, as we speak, um, I'm going back and forth with my uh, my editor, um, and, and she's helping me edit this uh, this work that um, I prepared. This is for the third time now. Um, mm-hmm. The first time I prepared this psychological covert war on hip hop. Um, I lost it in a house fire in 2008. Oh wow! Um, and then some burglaries. Uh, I lost uh, I lost some other manuscripts on thumb drives and that kind of thing. This time it's, it's well guarded, <laughs> and I'm going back and forth with my uh, editor to uh, actually finish it. It's because this is definitely a serious, serious labor. And it's one of those kind of arduous tasks that I just cannot wait to get done because it's just plaguing my brain. Uh, because there is a war going on, mm-hmm. um, a covert war. Um, we don't see it. And in many cases, I try to explain to people, and I won't get a, a a thorough chance to explain it in this talk, but I try to explain to people that there's a psychic war going on mm-hmm. for the hearts and minds of the people. Mm-hmm. A war that you may not be able to see. Um, in most cases, uh, you will see the ones and zeros um, in the back rooms of some of these programs that are going on that's disconnecting you from everything natural mm-hmm. and that's serving as a buffer between you and, uh, and nature, and it serves as a virtual or the cyber realm, so to speak, and it's actually you know, feeding you everything that you think that you need. So as long as you stay tapped in and plugged in to this concept called the matrix, you truly feel that you're actually living and you're not. So the psychological covert war dies into that particular war that's going on. But I, I'm, I, my main focus is um, entertainment and especially hip hop. Wow, that sounds fantastic. I can't wait for that to come out. Well, I'm, I'm really trying to get it out, but my editor, she is a very, very, very meticulous woman. <laughs> and, and, and it's a reason why I chose a woman, because uh, this male testosterone, this, this energy that we can't, we, we tend to dress up as, as, as maleness, so to speak, yeah. uh, definitely needs to be balanced out. And, and that's one of the conversations I wanted to have with you guys today. Yes. Um, the whole... Yeah, the whole concept. And then excuse me for just being just kind of upfront with it. And um, what, I, what I'm what i about to say and some of the things I'm about to say really needs no apology. It probably, need, it probably needs um, the, uh, the correct energy to get people to come up out of their comfort zone and grab a box cutter and cut themselves out of the box that they've allowed themselves to, uh, to be comfortably um, sitting in right now. But whole concept of calling God by these masculine names and these these pronouns that we use in reference to the Creator, when everything in nature comes in pairs. Mm-hmm. So if it comes in pairs, then why aren't we giving credence to and compliments to the feminine aspect? Yeah, exactly. Do you think those were <laughs> deliberate attempts to keep you from doing what you're doing? Oh, of course, simply because um, not that I'm any more special than the Peter Tosh and Bob Marley's and the Steve Biko's and the, the Mandela's or the Malcolm X or whomever. Um, I could never, you know, if it, from where I'm viewing it, I could never compare my work to the work that they've done because I stand on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. But um, all of us play a part. Um, there's these two beautiful young ladies that I've met um, Tanya and Beth, and little do they know they're actually playing a part in this whole thing. So when this is written, 
about. And people go back and they read back 10 years from now. You know, what is this talk about metaphysics? What is this talk about the psychological covert war? What is this talk about spirituality? Um, and they go back and they read, you know, we play a part in that. Mm-hmm. And we have to look at it just, you know, as such. I mean, can you actually pick out in the colony of ants? Can you actually pick out the ant who carried the last pebble? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> but all of them play a part. Yes. Right. Together. And that, right, exactly. And that's how we. And, and there's a there's a a saying coming, you know, off of the continent. Um, you know, I am. Yes. Because we are, therefore I am. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's how we have to look at it. Now, is that masculine or feminine? That's neither one. You see, we share in that because the balance is there. Natural equality is there. Mm-hmm. And I get, you know, I get told off quite a bit by <laughs> black <laughs> women, black <laughs> women, because they want to fight for this equality. And I'm like, you don't have to fight for it. You have it. Just be yourself. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. If you play your role and I play my role, the roles should complement one another. Thus creating harmony. Harmony. Exactly. So yeah. that's right. There is. I, I'm I'm really starting to, to see the shift from masculine to feminine. It's really quite incredible. I mean it's been millennia since it's uh since it's been balanced. Um and I think I see a lot of men who are getting in touch with their feminine side as well. And maybe you've even seen it in some of your friends who, you know, maybe are a little bit used to be a little bit more macho and, you know, now are becoming a little bit more sensitive and in tune and in touch. It's a beautiful thing to see. That's, right, that's very that's very necessary though mm-hmm. because we don't we don't find the over uh, uh, the over maleness if I could use that particular language because mm-hmm. um, I don't want to use another language. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, it's just it, it was always there. It's just that we had to put on the uh, the had the illusion of being super macho and and uh, simply because maybe we were hiding and masking something else. Mm-hmm. And they're being taught, you, you know, being taught to be macho and not cry and all these things. Right. Um. Yeah, and, that, and it kind of reminds me of what I've seen in the news about three or four weeks ago in reference to um, this whole idea of bullying. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, wow, this is, this is deep simply because it, um, the whole idea of America having television shows now, I think on my television, I think I have um, maybe 500 channels. Oh, my. Is that like, is that like the norm now? I haven't watched TV in about three years. <laughs> right. So it's like if you, if you have 500 channels and you have children and your children are witnessing yes. violent scenes every single day in the home, how dare you? come back now and say we should be more sensitive to one group or another to say, you know, we should stop bullying. Stop that. You're a bully. Yeah. And you're promoting bullying, bullying every single day on Channel Zero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of desensitizing is is going on. Yeah, and definitely. Right, but, but my thing is, that, and I think look, according to the war that's going on, it's being done on a subconscious level. Right. Oh, definitely. We don't even know what being said these things. Mm-hmm. Well, now, too, they don't have, I mean, the TV, of course, was perfect mind control, but now they have it right in the individual's pocket, right down to a person can have a PDA-type cell phone, so they have constant connection to the number one tools that control their minds, such as TV and video games and music and all of this. And these kids are carrying this around, and I, I think about it because... I'm 40 years old, but um, when I was younger, there was no internet quite yet, and there wasn't all this um, digital cameras, and, you know, we had Polaroids. And thank goodness, because the bullying, I can't imagine the peer pressure today mm-hmm. with these kids, and, and then they're being recorded, and before you know it, it's up on YouTube, and there's pictures, and Facebook, and it's just unbelievable. Right. And, and they're so disconnected from nature completely. But that's what we hope to do. We hope to we hope to make a difference and, and start changing that. 
Right. When I was growing up, you know, it was often a uh, backdrop to um, to the beautiful sunny days that mm-hmm. few of them that we did get in Long Island, New York. <laughs> yes. Um, we, we heard birds. We heard children playing, screaming, laughing. Mm-hmm. There was games that they uh, that they made up in the street. It wasn't sold by Mattel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jump so, ropes and chop. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing and singing. I love it. Yeah. Right. So we were forced to do that and be creative. Yes. Right. Now there's no playing at all in the concrete jungle. Mm-hmm. We don't take the chalk anymore and go out in the street and draw on the street and come up with different games that we play. Now, children inside. Children are plopping down on the couch with the the video, I mean, the, the video game controller in their hand. Yes. And it's hard to pull them away from that. Thus, now the children are getting heavier, sadder, unhealthy. Yes, very much so. Parents don't have time, and children are snacking. Parents are on the go. And it's a joke mm-hmm. when, I, when me and some of my friends got together, looked at these parental controls that they have on the computer. Oh, yeah. Children laugh at that stuff like, you're yeah, right, okay. They're the ones that wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they think of things out a lot quicker than we do. Yes. Be- yeah. Because they're wired for that. Mm-hmm. Um, every now and then, all of us, you know, we have to unplug. Yes. Turn it off. Turn all of it off. Mm-hmm. And do something very natural. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about using the bathroom because we have to do that every day. I'm talking about something very, I'm talking about very, very natural. I'm talking about some, you know, um, Dixie Chicks, Cowboy Take Me Away natural. Like, yeah. Nestling <laughs> you know in the bosom of your mother. I go outside and spend That's time right. with mommy every day. I have to. I have to right. unplug. I get, you know, I wear my laptop like a set of braces. The EMFs are crazy. A lot of the creating and stuff I do is, you know, on on the computer. And, you know, the Internet, as much as I love it and um, having all that knowledge at, at my fingertips, it uh, the Internet's killed TV, and that's and that's what it is now. And if you don't connect and, and go out and spend some time with mommy, you lose yourself. You become dense matter. And exactly, these right. children, they're not, they're not creating. And those, it's not even fostering those environments anymore for them to create. They just plug in and consume because we've become consumers. Right. And I think they're being fed on a psychological, subconscious yes. level. They're being fed the things that they're actually acting out. Yes. And I studied Stephen Jacobson's work, uh, nice. Mind, Con- Mind Control in America, and you know, he was 100% correct, and he was on yeah. it. And he talked about those stages on um, mind control, which we could see actually being manifested today in 2011. Yes. Totally. So it's no, it's no wonder that we, we, we get the results that we, that we get. And we scratch our head and wonder why. Well, they scratch their head because some of us, I think 5% of us of this total population, have figured it out. Mm-hmm. But, but who will listen? Right. Well, if you don't mind, um, especially for our listeners who do remember you from Public Enemy, uh, maybe we could take a short trip back. And apparently there was an interview where you made some kind of anti-Semitic statements that caused quite a stir, although nobody could find the statements. May I ask you what really happened with you in the split of Public Enemy? (laughs) I think... um... It's kind of ironic that you should say that because if it was so devastating that what I said, we should be able to find it. Yes. And I should be able to be uh, be put in a position where I'm taken to task on it, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. How come we can't find it? Right. <laughs> Somebody is just not telling the truth. Yeah. Um, but just real, real brief and uh, real quick, uh, this is how it went from top to bottom. Um, I was given um, the, a manuscript while I was out on the road. Mind you, I was the Minister of Information. Mm-hmm. And I think this, these first two points, if you kind of can make a mental note of these first two points, this is the basis of it all. Um, first point, public enemy was only supposed to last for two years. Okay. Okay. With that in mind, 
it was almost a race against the clock to raise the confidence level of the human family, all of us, surprisingly enough, including white people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was more apparent that we had a larger mission to reach out to educate white people because for some strange reason, the majority of black people think white people already know it all, and that's not the case. <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. the case, yes. <laughs> so um, in reaching out to the human family, it includes white people, although white and black people were writing about Professor Griff and public enemy as though we hated white people, and that just wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. So if, we were, if, if the program was supposed to last, the public enemy program was supposed to last, when I say program, don't, don't think it was a mind control program, mm-hmm. <laughs> what we put together was supposed to last for two years. We were going to educate and raise 5,000 black leaders, and we were going to go back into the communities and do the work that needs to be done. That was it in a nutshell. The whole idea of the, uh, the Jewish question came up when um, we had to actually deal firsthand with Jewish people. Now, mm-hmm. listen to a backdrop to that. If we're in the hood, and excuse me for raising my voice, oh, if we're in the hood and we ain't never dealt with white people, <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever, right? Right? And you're put in a situation where now you're meeting uh, not only your white fans, managers and producers and stage people and whoever else, media people and whatever. And no, no one said that we went to class for that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. culture shock, yes. Like, uh, and, and, and the sad part, I got not the sad part about it, but the real part about it is, is we, we remained who we were and talk the way we talk. Not in the sophisticated way that we are talking today. Mm-hmm. It was a lot more grimy than this. <laughs> are you following yeah. me? Yeah. And so in trying to pull this awesome task off, we're getting blown away and overwhelmed by like, wow. Okay, we never expected 20,000 white people to be putting their fists in the air. <laughs> All right, we got to go back. We got to go back to the drawing board. Yeah. I mean, seriously, we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting just loyal white fans with Public Enemy's logo carved in their heads. Yes, <laughs> yes. So not expecting that and not thinking that, we were letting young whites know, we're not talking about you. <laughs> we're talking about your parents, 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 grandparents that brought up into America in the holes of ships. Yeah. It's an ugly truth, but we have to speak to it. The song spoke to it. We spoke to it outside of the context. Uh, outside of the songs, we spoke to it in, in interviews and in lectures and this kind of thing. But now when the press gets a hold of it, now we hate white people, we hate Jewish people, we're blaming Jewish people for the, uh, the African Holocaust, it's the transatlantic slave trade and this, that, and the other, and whatever, whatever, whatever. And regardless of how much you twist it, nonetheless, we still have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, this is a bastard language called English. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to speak to people using a language that don't even, I can't even speak. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now with that as a backdrop, I go into an interview with a black man who, for the most part, didn't make me aware that he's recording the conversation. Mm-hmm. So we have an open conversation in reference to who's who, not only in the music industry, but on the global scene and the global front. Not really the front, but who's behind the scene. Mm-hmm. So I'm laying this stuff out. I'm laying out the, the octopus, I'm laying out who controls the music industry, oh, I'm the, wow. the media, and I'm laying all of this out, not from Professor Griff. I'm laying this out with information that I received from other Jewish people, mm-hmm. handed to me in a manuscript by a black man, interviewed by a black man. Wow. So I'm so far removed from it, it's not even funny, but when the ish goes down, it all falls back on Professor Griff. Be- that. mm-hmm. now, that's childish. Right. And I'm like, no, no, no. But I took it and and sad but true, the wounds are still being healed, not only with myself and um, my Jewish friends, mm-hmm. myself and Chuck and some of the other brothers in Public Enemy, because that did, I think, more damage to us on a personal level than any white Jewish person could ever yeah. imagine. You're talking about families and friendships mm-hmm. and Mm-hmm. Your brothers. People not speaking for years, and the sad part about that, I felt betrayed simply because you know, and this is no, and this is no secret in 2011 because the majority of it I put in my book. 
Mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, you mean to tell me you have a private conversation with me and you agree that there's an overwhelming amount of Jewish people that are in controlling positions in the music industry, but yet when you go public, you can't even utter one name, one corporation, one company, one, stop that. That's just being cowardly. But I don't have that in me. I'm not a coward like that. Yeah. It is what it is. And the, and the reason why I can say that, because it's not my information. Right. It's information that I was receiving from, you know, for the most part, other Jewish people. So well, the manuscript that I had in my hand was The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 1, even before it became a book. Wow. Not to say that all the information there was correct. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, I'm not saying all the information was accurate, but even if it wasn't accurate, it wasn't coming from black people or Professor Griff. It was a book compiled and put together with all Jewish references, Jewish quotes, and so I thought that was very cowardly. Yeah, they kind of left all that part out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, of course, of yeah. course. And then not only that, they left the part out that I had a beautiful conversation with the Jewish woman that was supposedly engaged and to be married to David Mills at the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't hostile. It wasn't. She understood that. Okay, you're a young black man coming from the hood. I wouldn't expect you to know X, Y, and Z and, you know, aspects of the Jewish history and the suffering and that kind of thing. And no, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I can admit that. Yes. Yeah. If I had a chance to do it over, I'd, I'd probably be a lot more thorough. And, and, and I did apologize for the manner in which I presented the information because David Mills took it like I was on the uh, offensive and just kind of attacking. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we young Black dudes coming from the hood, man. We had no real experience with Jewish people like that. The only thing we knew of Jewish people was that they owned everything in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's the reality of it. Yeah, yeah. And we knew we knew a little bit about the Holocaust because we've seen it on TV. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What else did we know? So it was no personal thing. They never mm -hmm. got from me that I hate Jews or I hate this and calling them names, and I don't do that. That's, that's childish. Mm -hmm. I presented information that was given to me as the Minister of Information, and I laid it out in an interview, and all of a sudden I become public enemy number one inside of public enemy, and I hate everybody. Oh, no. That. Mm -hmm. You couldn't meet me in a dark damn alley uh, and hypnotize me and get that kind of stuff out of my subconscious mind because <laughs> right. it's not there. It's not there. Um, didn't have any real personal hatred against any white person, Irish, Italian, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's just that I knew aspects of the history and why black people were suffering. Right. At the same time, did I grow up with white people and have white friends? Of course. Of course. But there's just certain truths that we're not adult and mature enough to kind of handle. You know how many people I've hung up on on the last 72 hours? I, I guess not 72 hours, probably last two or three days. Right. A, a, in reference to this uh, Osama bin Laden thing, oh, yeah. I'm like, get off my phone with that. Seriously, that's childishness. Get off my phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm not. I'm not buying into the fact that all of a sudden now you track down a man after ten years and you kill a man that's already been dead. <laughs> right. Exactly. That must have been really easy. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> so I'm not full, but then you, no one sees you, but now you dump the body in the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm just not falling for that. That's just, come on. You're insulting our intelligence. Exactly. exactly. And then the sad part of seeing black people in the streets celebrating as though we own something in America. Yeah. And, I, and, and literally, excuse my language, I'm like, sit your ass down. You don't own shit. You don't <laughs> run anything. <laughs> Seriously. Right. So I'm like, come on. But anyway, that, yeah. that's, that's my take on it. And even today, a few years ago, I believe, when David Mill died, dropped dead on the movie set, you know, I think a few minutes after he died, you know, my phone was blowing up. Mm -hmm. Oh, I bet. And it's like, I don't know what to say about that. I'm just kind of like, you know, no one dances in the street over somebody getting murdered and exactly. that kind of thing and, and dying. Come on. Right. But it's like when, when he, as a matter of fact, you, you guys probably didn't know he apologized. Oh, uh. really? We don't read about that. No. Because we want to keep the Professor Griffiths out there and everyone with that mindset that they feel hate Jewish people. We want to keep that going. But at the same time, simultaneously, you will blow up a Flavor of Love show. 
Right. Uh, and that kind of imagery to well, serve as the face, the new face of public enemy. Stop that. Yeah. Well, that's what I want to ask you, because you talked a bit about Flava Flav and, and Brigitte Nielsen and how he affectionately calls her Gita. And you looked it up and it translated to God of the Dead. What are your thoughts about that? Well, my thing is I laid it out on a metaphysical level, really, really, truly on an esoteric level. And I laid it out and I had to stop talking about it because this is sad to say. <laughs> I had to stop talking about it because... It's just too deep for people. And it's like, what is that mm. you don't get? It's simple. And dealing with the spirit realm, there's certain laws that govern the spirit realm. The essence yeah. of who we are has been here before. And inside of giving that lesson to people, I'm often criticized about this whole religious meltdown mm -hmm. that they say I do in my lecture. And I thought, like a religious meltdown. I'm just saying that these religious concepts were borrowed and stolen right. from um, African spiritual concepts to make religion. I don't right. do religion at all. It's just right. not, not something that I do. I don't have to send my prayer to someone for someone to calculate it and send it to God, and then I got to wait for God to get back with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why can't I tap into the self and just be me and communicate with the God realm, and I'm fine? And it's just another way that they're using esoteric concepts for mind control. Exactly. So I had to reintroduce, now listen to this awesome task. And if any of you guys in the room would like to take this task on, I will gladly trade places with you. Could you please tell me how you go about talking to a man that have made over five and a half million dollars on TV that you're in the group with, who thinks he's a star now and people love him, who's still on drugs? Mm. How do you speak to, through the ignorance? Right. How do you speak to that to reach him and say, listen, the things that I laid out on an esoteric level in reference to you and the strange love thing and the flavor of love thing, how do you get him to understand, listen, there's a deity operating inside of you that you need to become aware of. Mm -hmm. So let me reintroduce you to you or right. aspects of you. Don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Don't want to hear it. Where can I get some weed from you? Where are we going? Can we, where are we hanging out at? <laughs> yeah. What are we drinking? What, we, what kind of bottles are we popping? Come on, man. Right. There's something deeper mm -hmm. here. Then on top of all of that, what happened to the mission of Public Enemy? To raise the conscious level of, of, of our people and the human family. What happened to that? So it seems like I stuck to it on different levels, but everyone else just kind of fell short doing it in their, I shouldn't say fell short, they're doing it in their own way, but I'm the only one that gets criticized. So just to set the record straight, I tried to set the record straight in my first couple of chapters of my book that it's not about hating anyone, especially Jewish people. It's about being honest so we can uh, confront these things that probably will affect us both as fellow human beings on the same path. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'm right. just a little bit darker than you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's it. So it's hard to get these concepts over to people that's really not trying to hear it and and – you know, my worst critics are religious people, mm -hmm. simply because the concepts that I bring are not necessarily taught in religion. Can I give you one of those concepts real quick? Absolutely. Okay, something really, really basic that all of us can probably agree on, whether we're male, female, Jew, Gentile, Muslim, Christian, black, white, whatever. The law of karma will affect all of us, mm -hmm. regardless of who we are, right or wrong. Okay, what goes around will definitely come back around. How about the whole concept, if it rains outside, regardless of who we are, we go outside, we are getting wet, right or wrong. Right. So the creator is no respecter of persons in what your last name is. God is no respecter of persons. Are you following the divine law? Right. That is the question right there. Now we have to talk about what is the divine law. Now, whether you sit on a white toilet bowl or a gold one or whatever your color toilet bowl is, nonetheless, we have to use the bathroom every day because it's just what it is, right or wrong? Right. Okay. So we deal with divine law, things that are going to happen regardless. Mm -hmm. So I sit faith, belief, in all these con religious concepts, and I just put them to the side. And this is why I get talked about. Because if you look up the word faith, you and I will have a problem. Because you have this religious stuff going on, and you're basing it on faith 
And I just don't have that concept. I just don't have that concept. If it's the time for the dandelion to grow, the dandelion is going to grow regardless, right or wrong. Even through the concrete, it's just time for the dandelion to grow. And this is, these are basic things that religious people just can't wrap their brains around or their spirit around. So when I say, I'm Griff, pardon me, I'm God, mm. having a human experience called Griff, people have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Why? Simply because everything in nature is inside of you. Tanya, yes. inside of you, Beth, right or wrong? Right. Okay, so if that's the case, then you're actually God in motion, aspects of the manifestation of the creator. That's who you are. Mm-hmm. We have to use this third dimensional body that we have to operate in this third dimensional paradigm. So you have some pretty eyes, a nice shape, cute little nose, nice lips. That's fine, but that's not you. Exactly. Thank you. The essence of you is in you. So subsequently, so, so when I meet people, you know, like, so how you doing? My name is Griff. What's your name? Oh, okay. And um, so what do you do? Well, I work at, no. <laughs> what do you do? Exactly. <laughs> Who are you? They don't know. Right. Right. We're taught to search so, outside ourselves for everything. Exactly. And that concept I cannot buy into. And I'm telling you guys, I'm sure you all know aspects of black history. We've been knocked upside the head and dragged to America and everything that we reach for is outside of the self. Yes. Once I discovered that, I'm like, nope, not going for it anymore. So now I'm in conflict with, first I was in conflict with the self. (laughs) Then in conflict with everything around me, including family and friends, because everybody around me is Christian, except one or two radical brothers in the hood that uh, decided to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was an argument. (laughs) Right, right. And then the Afrocentric thing, and then you're still trying to hold on to the white Jesus, but yet you want an African name, but still on your driver's license, you, you're Dwayne Williams. But <laughs> when in the hood, they call you Mutaka, so-and-so, you know, whatever, Baba, whoever. Stop. Yeah. These, are, these are contradictions. It's like, come on. Searching so and we have to deal with the we have to deal with the mystical and magical paths of the self and the not-self. In most cases, the not-self wins that that's it on the jewish question i can't i don't even i don't even have enough words in my vocabulary they say the average human has 400 words that we use (laughs) i don't even have enough words to kind of explain that um it'd be better if i explained it in person because maybe you could see my countenance and my body language to to let you guys know that i'm there i'm so sincere about this i don't it's not a hatred thing yes i can feel that and thank you. Thank you for taking the time and explaining that. It's, um, you know, we see it all around. We're taught to search and search and search outside of ourselves for what is really only inside. And, you know, to me, this the most important part of this journey is the journey of self-love. Love isn't something that you're taught. Um, as a great lyric says, love is, love is sublime, not subliminal. And when a person doesn't love themselves, it, they can't begin to look in the mirror. So when you ask right. your buddy there to, he, he's just not ready to look in the mirror. It, I mean, it takes a lot to take responsibility for all that we are, all that we do, all that we say, think. It's hard. It's not easy. And we're, and we're taught to do just the opposite and to, to run, to hide, and to search and search. Because searching, uh, you can then control the person and you can make money off of them too. Right, exactly. Right there, let me ask you, can you shed a little bit of light on the perpetuation of mind control in hip-hop music, as well as through fashion and the display of symbols? I think in attempting to do that, I've often said that I'm probably not the best one to answer that particular question. This is why. No, no, no. I think I can answer it, but I'm probably not the best one to answer it. (laughs) (laughs) So if we're part of a team, I'm probably the best not the best free throw shooter, but I can shoot. <laughs> well, take a shot. <laughs> okay. If there's a technical foul, you might not want Griff to shoot it. <laughs> Show on to somebody else to shoot it, then we good. it. You understand what I'm saying? But nonetheless, yes. um, I'm saying all that to say this, that I pride myself on standing on the shoulders of those that came before me that actually did it well. And I don't care what their complexion is. 
mm-hmm. this is a lot of what kind of feedback that I get from a lot of black people. Yo, man, yo, son, how come you don't use um, your re- black resources in your in your lecture? What's up with Jordan Maxwell? What's up with Michael Tessarian and, and all these other people? And all these Jewish people that you're using? Because they did the research. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope that doesn't move me like that. I'm like, okay, so if Michael Tessarian did the research and he talked about the sacred use of... Uh, the subversive use of sacred symbols in the media. Brilliant work. Yes, very mm-hmm. much so. You can't, you can't, we can't deny that. Yeah. I don't know the man personally, but I did spend my $40, 50 to send to the man so I could get his work so I could study and do the research to educate myself on these signs and symbols. The same with Jordan Maxwell. We cannot deny, we cannot deny the, uh, the life work that they've put out there. And we have to kind of extract from it and kind of build on it and push it. So I'm saying all that to say this. I stand on their shoulders. Um, we understand the Steve Coakley's that are out there, the Ashwa Kwesi's, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark. But to go into uh, Stephen Jacobson's work, you know, and put it out there and not give Stephen Jacobson the credit, come on, that's not fair. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and don't do that because he's white and Jewish. Stop that. That's childish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So these images that are out there, I say, well, we'll probably, be, they will definitely use as a mind control experiment. And when you go back and look into the, the MK Ultras and the MK Delta mind control experiments that was going on in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time you, you do get to 2011 and you do look at, you go back to look at, pardon me, you know, what John Stockwell wrote in one of his lectures dealing with the secret wars of the CIA and how the CIA used mind control experiments. I even brought that to Chuck D's attention when he um, was on Air America. Mm. I said, did you know that Air America was a name used for a covert operation? <laughs> so in looking at these things, I'm pointing these things out to people, and people are looking at me like, you're crazy. So now I get written off as the worst kind of conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Exactly. And the sad part about that, I can prove everything I see, but can they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that poses a problem because now when you dig up MK Ultra, MK Delta, and you start to go into um, these mind control experiments ran by the CIA inside and outside of the United States, you know, laws are being broken, people, are, uh, families are being torn apart, people are losing their lives. Yes. And people act like it's just, we throw people away like it's nothing. Mm-hmm. So I started seeing it in the music industry, especially in hip hop. Yeah. And I started speaking out about it, and it became a problem for a lot of people. But since I came up in hip hop, and I was training brothers out of prison, and we had 107 people in our organization, and I'm not afraid to say we were training uh, brothers that was coming out of jail that were killers. Mm-hmm. We was trying to reform their lives. Yeah. But nonetheless, those are the same brothers that came to our aid when people wanted to attack us and do harm to us. Right. Even to this day, even as of, until yesterday, mm-hmm. being threatened by these cyber thugs, and these internet gangsters. Yeah. <laughs> so I started to see it in hip hop and I started calling it out. And mm-hmm. it just so happens that Jay-Z's name came up on the radar. Kanye West's name came up on the radar. Rihanna, Beyonce, Eminem, and some other whose name came up on the radar, and we had to talk about it. Then I started talking about the blood rituals and and the deaths that were going on in hip-hop that no one was talking about. How could five or six people die and everybody just say, oh, well. Yeah, I know. Gosh. (laughs) And I'm like, wait a minute. That's someone's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last straw with me was Jam Master J. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't take it. So I said, no, nope, I'm sorry. But it cost me my life. I'm going to say something about it. And I did. And even when I began the task of doing the research, I was even blown away at the amount of information that was out there that they're not telling the American people or the public. Yes. Especially in hip hop. I ran into racism firsthand, not perpetrated by white people, you would think, carried out, the system of it carried out subconsciously by black people. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. That is dangerous. That is dangerous. Very much so. 
Because every time we think of racism, we think white people doing something to affect black people, and we never think that there's a black person fostering and pushing the agenda. And then when you bring it to their attention, they say, no, that's reverse racism. Right. Then they play it off like you're being homophobic. You play it off like you're anti-Jewish, anti-white, or you're bugging, you're tripping, or just straight out, that is crazy. <laughs> Are you following me? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, come on, none of the above. Read this, written by this person. Now let's lay it next. Let me give you a real example. Let me just play around with it. There's a gentleman by the name of Gary Webb who died, who was shot in the head. Gary Webb was the one that blew the cover off of the CIA operation that they were doing in, in L.A. in reference to the, the Contra scandal with the CIA crack cocaine wars that were going on mm -hmm. in L.A. Um, supplying the Bloods and Crips with guns and weapons and putting drugs among the gang members and this kind of thing. Right. Okay, so when Gary Webb was murdered, I took note, wrote it down, did some research with the research team, and I found out that there was about five to six more people murdered in the same exact way. Now, that's, is that conspiracy theory? Or is that a coincidence? Or is it actual fact? Right. Because I started looking inside of the music industry and I started seeing the same thing. Oh, okay, double tap, bullet to the head, but they said he committed suicide. Right. Sure. Yeah, he so was that started, server, right? Yes. And a very good one. Yeah, I remember you know, wasn't that. Right, wasn't afraid to go out in the street and go get the story until they found him uh, with two bullet holes in him slumped over his typewriter. Now, I don't know how eloquent you guys are with noticing these same stories that are coming out on these new, new improved 2010, 2011 cop shows. Mind you, they give the illusion of justice and you never get justice, but nonetheless, you have the illusion of it. CSI and all these kind of cop shows that are, that where they solve the mystery in 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, some of the deaths in hip hop have really never been solved. Yeah, exactly. So in trying to understand that, I tried to put it in such a way where we can digest it. So what I decided to do was, rather than talk about it, let me just show the actual images. So now my slide presentation consists of a thousand slides. Oh, a nice. thousand, one thousand. You know how long it takes me to get for one thousand slides? <laughs> show? <laughs> presentation? I'm like, man, y'all better bring some damn pajamas and a pillow and a blanket. <laughs> So when I, when I laid out, people are just in disbelief. Like, first of all, how the hell do you find time to do all this research? <laughs> and then the right. strip to stand up for four hours and, and deliver it. But nonetheless, the imagery is there. I'm starting to see the handshakes, the Freemasonic handshakes. Right. I'm starting yeah. to see the sirens and the cymbals. I'm starting to see these things in hip hop. And I'm scratching my head because a minute ago, you were talking about doing a stanky leg in the Dougie, mm -hmm. wearing white tees and, and making these silly songs for kindergarten students. Mm -hmm. So now here this Professor Griff guy comes and talks about some esoteric stuff, some metaphysical stuff, some Freemasonic stuff, some Illuminati stuff. They're scratching their head, and all of a sudden now, we got some popping Frisco internet YouTube scholars that all of a sudden now want to take the lead. I say, well, be my guest. Mm -hmm. Right. This is not a big task to get people to understand this. And I tell these young brothers, I'm like, you're not going to watch a couple of YouTube clips now and become a scholar. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I had to remind them, I am 50 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not this young buck. <laughs> yeah. And like you guys, I was back when we didn't have computers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Microfiche. <laughs> yeah. Right. What exactly. does that mean? That means you had to take your ass to the damn library. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And sit down and read it and discuss it and analyze it. And in most cases, hell, we didn't have laptops. So how yeah. was you going to deliver? You had to be passionate enough and knowledgeable enough to stand in front of an audience with relatively no notes and, and deal with it. You had to know your subject. Walk the talk. Exactly. Nowadays, oh, no, not at all. Point and click. N not at all. <laughs> Now, speaking of that imagery and seeing the handshakes and everything in front of you, have you ever been witness to an occult practice? And I know you've talked a bit about sacrificial kills. Um, when did you first learn about that? When Tupac was assassinated and I met John Patosh, who wrote the FBI's war on Tupac's war on black leadership, 
Mm-hmm. And having a conversation with him, it reminded me of the mind control program inside of hip hop. Mm-hmm. As soon as Tupac, and this is no, please, this is no reflection, and I'm not saying this and being mean spirited to any of the brothers that are out there that I'm about to mention. And, I, and a lot of times I had to put that out there to let them know I'm not being mean spirited about it. When Tupac was assassinated, someone had to fill that slot. Yes. Several people tried. And the two people, ironically, that almost looked like Tupac that filled that slot was Ja Rule and DMX. If you look back on how they look, they look like Tupac. Ball head, dark skin brothers. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Whoopie, whoop. Okay. But the slot had to be filled. In, in my mind, I'm like, why? Why? Okay. Biggie gets shot down. That slot has to be filled. Right. Surprisingly enough, after them two gentlemen were taken out of here, Jay-Z and Puffy became very popular. Mm-hmm. That, I, I wrote it in my notes. And I started connecting the dots. Mm-hmm. Aaliyah dies, left eye dies, Jam Master J. Now right. I'm going on and on, and I'm writing these notes down, and I'm connecting the dots on who they connected to. It's all leading back to a handful of people that are very successful now. Now, what do I do with that information? Please tell me, what do I do with that? It's in my chest. It's waking me up 3.30 in the morning every other morning. Are you going to be a coward, Griff, now and not say anything when you know what you're feeling is the truth? Right. So I started connecting the dots and I started putting it out there. And when I start, when I went back to study Steve Coakley's work, Jordan Maxwell, mm-hmm. I wasn't introduced to Michael Tessarian then. I went back to study their work and I said, wow, this is the same. This sacrificial stuff is going on not only in religion, it goes on in secret societies. And it now is going on in hip hop. Have the Illuminati, through mm-hmm. the Masonic organizations, infiltrated the music industry mm-hmm. and all these just rituals that we're going through? I was like, that's a question that we had to answer. Well, mm-hmm. I had to answer for myself. Mm-hmm. So when I started putting it together, it almost told the story by itself. So mm-hmm. I just asked basic questions. Like, for example, let me ask you guys a question. Mm-hmm. What was Lisa Left Eye Lopez doing in South America with Dr. Sadie? Yeah, you know, I remember watching the that last um because they you know they taped some of that for a VH1 thing, and mm-hmm. boy, could I feel her and <laughs> continue because that that that's always sat with it me. Almost, it almost brings you to tears. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So hearing it through the African grapevine, I ran into her sister, and I, we sat down like. She said, Griff, my sister was down there trying to cleanse herself of the madness that goes on not only in her life, but in the world, and especially in the music industry. Mm -hmm. So guess what I discovered? I'm like, well, who was she signed to? What was she doing? Mm -hmm. She was signing Suge Knight. Mm -hmm. Um. See, you see them sponsors you just gave me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That speaks volumes. Yeah, Yeah. well, you don't get goosebumps for nothing. Yeah. That speaks volumes. I'm like, wow, okay, now I see it. Mm -hmm. Now, why? And just answer this for me. And I'm I'm paraphrasing Dave Chappelle. Mm. He said he was best friends with Martin Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Why was Martin Lawrence running around Hollywood, waving a gun, running down the street, saying that they're out to get me? What was that about? If Professor Grip is crazy, and I'm talking about blood sacrifice and this kind of stuff in hip hop, Masonic, Illuminati stuff going on, why is that happening? Mm-hmm. If Tanya and Beth all of a sudden became uh, close to billionaires, definitely millionaires, overnight, would you be on TV taking up your damn clothes in front of the world? Mm-mm. Nope. Absolutely not. That's right wrong. Right. So explain Mariah Carey then and, and Beyonce. She explained this to me when she marries Tommy Matola, one of them cats, and all of a sudden she wants a divorce. I said in my lecture, she seen something. Mm-hmm. She heard something. She right. was a witness to something that she wanted no part of. Yeah. Right. So subsequently now, shortly after the divorce, we're going to write her off as being crazy. And that's what they did. That's the easiest MO. Oh, they've lost yeah. it. <laughs> They're yeah. crazy. Right, exactly. They need meds. <laughs> right, exactly. So I'm saying, I'm, I'm tying all this together. 
in just a, in a few short years, I managed to put this stuff out there, and um, people are waking up to the madness that's going on in the music industry. Mm-hmm. A lot of the people that are tied to some of the entertainers that are still making money in a, in a music industry that really doesn't even exist anymore. We don't make good music. No. We make good products, and we need the music to sell the damn product. Right. You know, can I ask, um, at, at Wash Your Brain, we really realize that music and frequencies affect our own vibrations and in ways that most people don't even understand. I've heard you say a lot about music that targets just the lower chakras. What, in your opinion, are some examples of artists that you believe target the heart and higher chakras? To be honest with you, are you sitting down? Yes, sir. Oh, you are okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I hear um, Otis Redding, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, you just said does something to me. I'm even choked up now. Mm. I can't. That's higher vibration to me. Yes, yes. Um, and we can kind of agree on that. Um, when I hear certain aspects of natural wind instruments. Yeah. Are, are you following me? Mm-hmm. That's, see, that, that raises the vibration. Mm-hmm. Even when I hear the, the raw, gutsy uh, um, tones coming from what Bob Marley was saying, mm-hmm. how do you deny that? <laughs> mm-hmm. right. The only thing you can do is close your eyes and just feel. Mm-hmm. Yes. Plain and simple. Even with some of the edgier kind of subject matters that he was dealing with, nonetheless, you feel it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You feel it. It's not a tug of war. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, can you imagine waking up in a damn hood? <laughs> 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 I'm like, dude. Yeah, I lived in sensory overload. (laughs) I lived in Brooklyn. (laughs) I lived by the Mercy Project. Sensory overload. You can't even think with that going on. Yeah. I don't care who you are. Right, right. You dull the senses. You can't think. And now what you want to do, you want to feed that energy center. You want to feed the lower chakras. Food, sex, Lighting L's, drinking. Thank you. Lower vibration. So now when you bump into a Professor Griff on the street and I'm having a conversation with you and you try to lower the vibration of the conversation and I'm trying to raise it up. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Then mm-hmm. it's this tug of war. Subsequently, you hear a lot of black men talk about, you know what I mean? 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 No, I don't know what you mean. Say what you mean. Yes. You feel me, son? You feel yeah. me? No, I don't feel you. So subsequently, some of us hear what I'm saying, and some of us say, I see what you're saying. Some of us say, I get what you're saying. So we have this, what is it um, called? Cognitive dissident, I believe. Mm-hmm. We have two opposing forces trying to occupy that same space, and it's a tug of war now. So it's yeah. like, okay. And then the deeper science, when you talk about Hilton Otima, you're talking about the gate of God, which I tried to introduce at one time, but had to pull back from it to get people to understand that this electromagnetic field that surrounds the earth is the same electromagnetic field that surrounds the body. And it's called your aura. Crystals have memory. Mm-hmm. Yes. This is why they put it in the television. Yeah. <laughs> this is why when we on Skype late at night, showing the body parts to other people across town and <laughs> across the country... <laughs> It's a memory inside of a damn computer. Yeah. Right. This is why they make LCD television, liquid crystal displays, mm-hmm. plasma, HD. It's a memory. It's crystals. But to get people to understand that, it's like, come on. I mean, to me, okay, let me put it this way. To me, I can resonate with it real easy because not that I was brought up that way and I had this, I sat on a mountain somewhere with, and got some ancient Chinese secrets. I didn't do that. <laughs> I grew up in the hood just like everyone else. Mm-hmm. But I stopped lending my energy to the negative stuff. There's a, there's, a, there's a slide that I show 
with a brother with his hat twisted backwards with a nine millimeter sitting next to him, sitting across from a clansman with a butcher knife, and they're playing chess. And they, when I show that slide, I tell people, even though we're, we're participating in this thing called the game of life, I still don't have to hate my enemy. I don't have to waste my energy hating enemy. I can put that energy into the game of life and come up with uh, strategies and tactics in order to win in life. Right. But now since I'm vibrating on a higher frequency, I'm trying to send out invitations. Mm. Mm. Nice way to put it. So that's just in a nutshell, Professor Grist. I mean, right now as we speak, so trying to get my seventh octave album through, and, and I think speech from Arrested Development said it better mm. than I could ever say it. He said that, can you imagine if our organic thoughts did not have to go through the hands and through the lens and through the filter of mm. this machine world? Imagine what consciousness would be like. <laughs> yeah. He said that in a movie called The Diary of a Decade by Jason Orr mm. that's mm. coming out. Beautiful piece of uh, work by Jason Orr. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I'll definitely and check that out. Yeah. If we just kind of left it organic, if I was able to just experience the idea of going to a concert and sitting in row number 25 and just experiencing some of these artists, I would probably appreciate them a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't mind buying the, the damn T-shirt. <laughs> you know <what> I'm <laughs> Yeah, totally. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah. But now it's like, come on. So we talked a lot. We've talked a lot about Masons, um, and I don't think a lot of people are aware of the Bully. Um, can you offer the Boulay? Yeah, the Boulay offer any enlightenment on that? Well, the Boulay are the advisors to the king. The, the Boulay is actually the, the black skull and bones, so to speak because that's what they pattern themselves kind of after. And they just kind of serve as the gatekeepers. And it's, it's, it's kind of sad for black people because it buys into the whole talented test, not necessarily saying that the talented test was going to look out for the five or the, uh, the 85% mass of, of black people. And they're not. Mm -hmm. We can see that now. The masses of black people, matter of fact, the masses of the human family will suffer and the wealth will be in the hands of the, the you know, the one to 10%. Mm -hmm. And they're not sharing the wealth. And when I say the wealth nowadays, I'm talking about the idea of getting a clean glass of damn water. Yeah. Right. Good luck. Right. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about some damn tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, especially with Codex Alimentarius. I'm talking about getting a damn, uh, some vitamin C and some damn herbs. I'm not talking about diamonds and, the latest car and the latest T-shirt that's out. I'm not talking about that. Right. I'm talking about some basic stuff that you're going to need to exist on the planet. How about fresh air? Yeah. Clean <laughs> water, good food. Right. Right. So, you know, I see all of a sudden now a lot of people, especially they're given the illusion of going green. Yes. This is, oh, man. I probably have to calm myself down before I have that conversation about Codex Alimentarius and some of these other things. The Implantable Bio Microchip and mm -hmm. all of a sudden multinational corporations want to encourage people to go green and while at the same time they're still poisoning people. Right. Well, it's that whole false sense of, um, oh, sure, you're being responsible if you eat organic and buy green and recycle. Oh, yeah, you're doing your part, but it's still just a part of being a consumer. They're still just making money. Um, if you wear the recycling symbol, that makes it okay. I mean, <laughs> right. But it's, it's all an illusion. You've seen mm -hmm. the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You've seen the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water go down the yellow brick road, which is gold mm -hmm. on the esoteric level. You've mm -hmm. seen them carrying the, the, the animal, the dog, which represents the lower nature, carrying it with them all the time. Right. And in most cases in the, in the television show or the movie, the lower nature were carrying out some of the tasks that the higher nature was supposed to carry out mm -hmm. or the higher self. You've seen the Wicked Witch of the West, which represents America or that mentality. And then when you finally got to Oz, you found out that this little explicit deleted was behind the curtain. You understand what I'm saying? Controlling <laughs> everything. It was just a big illusion. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, excuse my language. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> it's fine. You're fine. <laughs> But well, while we're on the word fornication under the consent of king. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so it's, it's, it's very real to me now, and I'm not easily led in the wrong direction. I see what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
but once again trying to invite people to this particular you know school of knowledge or school of thought is a very very difficult task and to be honest with you i've lost family members and friends that just don't speak to me anymore. yeah me too me too yeah Quite a few. Oh, I'm, good. So join the club, and I'll feel so alone. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I mean, really, I'm 40 years old, and I can count my friends on one hand. Um, it wasn't always like that, but um, you know, my evolving, they they've dropped away. They, you know, oh, Tanya's crazy. You know. Um, yeah. Can but, I speak to that for a second? Isn't it sure. amazing that long as we're doing lower nature stuff, lower vibratory stuff, we're cool. Oh, lower absolutely. energy stuff. Low frequency stuff. As long as I'm drinking with you and we lighting L's and bagging chicks at the club, I'm fine. Yes. Right. As long as I'm gambling and drinking and eating bad food, 3.30 in the morning, greasy food from out of a damn window that they're passing food out of, we're fine. But as soon as I want to go organic and eat right and take care of myself and I don't want to hang out late, I need proper rest, I'm drinking water, I'm jogging, exercising, treating, respecting people um, on all colors, all complexions, all nationalities, all religions. Oh, there's something wrong with Griff. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I'm crazy because I love myself and I don't watch TV and I don't eat fast food. I mean, <laughs> these, these <laughs> right. are all the, you know, and I, and I don't subscribe to religion. Um, these are all the things that, that make me crazy to other people. But it's, you know, we seek to be led until we find the leader within. Mm -hmm. And in everything that's going on, we're taught to, to search outside ourselves, And that's what, you know, what we're doing right here, what you've done, you know, the majority of your life, all these things is to try to remind each other that we've got it all. We've got all the power, all the love, everything that we ever need right inside. And that's, that's what I teach in reference to the whole idea of education. I let students know mm. that everything that you need to be the best you that you could possibly be lies with inside of you. Yes, right. All you need is a curriculum to bring it out. That is it. And no one grades that but the self. Mm-hmm. Plain and simple. Mm-hmm. At, um, at Wash Your Brain, our goal is really to empower and inspire our youth. We realize that most of the programming and conditioning happens at a very early age. Right. Let me ask you, if you were given the chance to educate young people, what would be the most valuable thing, in your opinion, to try and teach them? The most valuable thing that I would teach young people is the value of self-knowledge, mm -hmm. knowing self. I could. There's no other science. There's no other discipline that I could possibly fathom or come up with to let them know that's that's more important than that. Every great philosopher, everyone taught, know the self. You have to know the self simply because this whole conversation that we've been having is about pulling these things out of the self. Mm -hmm. Even if you pull out the not self, nonetheless, it's part of the self. This is why I get in this kind, kind of conflict with religious people because they take these things outside of the self and point out in the sky somewhere. And I'm like, no. Yeah. It's inside of the self. For example, Christians with the Jesus and the 12 disciples, I often teach, no, you may be the Jesus that you have to take yourself down off of the crossroads of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on an esoteric level. And the 12 disciples are 12 different aspects of the divine self. You. Yes. You. You carry your cross. Mm hmm. Muslims. You have a law and you have the 99 attributes of a law. Why can't you be the center of that? And the 99 attributes are the 99 attributes of the God self. Mm -hmm. The Ifa in Yoruba, any of the African traditions in dealing with the Orishas. If there's 400 Orishas, two female, 200 male, and 200 female, these are aspects of the divine self. That's it. So it's the knowledge of the self, it's knowing thyself is the, is the thing that I would value and I would want to pass on to young people. Oh, thank you, Chris. That's great. That's great. Well, we know you're pressed for time, um, but we really, really appreciate it. I, I kind of am, but I didn't want to throw that in there because 
I wanted to keep the energy going and just yeah. whatever we <laughs> Thank got. <you. laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can uh, do it again sometime and maybe talk about your new book. Well, I, I really wanted to ask you guys, can we do it again? Because there are some things I wanted to go over and read so we can put a tap on this to let people know that we're not crazy. Yes. Yes. Well, honey, I'm, that people I'm very... that wrote about this and etched it in stone that we can read to people and let them know and we're to go get it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you so much for this. Your energy is so incredible. I'm absolutely blown away by you. I want to plug your website. Is there anything else I can refer? You, you know, um, like, like I said, I'm, I'm the Seven Octaves album, my band, we, it's a rap metal band, and um, it's the, uh, the God Damage. Okay. Um, my book, The Psychological Covert War on Hip Hop, which hopefully will be out this month, and um, the present book I have out now, Analytics, um, and analytics basically is not a very difficult kind of term. A lot, I know a lot of people wrestle with that term, but it's just critical thinking. That's all. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, other than that, you know, I am I am a growing photographer because I am oh. using that to balance out just kind of dealing with this everyday stuff. The last thing I shot, you know, I'm crawling on my hands and knees in the grass because I'm trying to use my macro lens to shoot a, uh, <laughs> a <laughs> I was shooting a ladybug. Oh, I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's 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 me at 50 years old. I'm um, looking 35, still doing one arm push ups. Oh, uh -huh. you look great. Yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. thank you. Well, great. Can't wait to do this again. And thank you, Griff, for your time and energy and oh, helping yeah, us wash thanks. our brains. Yeah, yeah thank thanks. You I really so appreciate much. you guys. Yeah, Griff, we love you. Thank you so yep. much. Love you, love you guys, too. You take care, right? Yeah, thank you. you take care. Oh, thank you very much. You have been listening to a Wash Your Brain Collective Public Service announcement. We can be found via podcast on iTunes and by visiting us at washyourbrain.org and subscribing to our RSS feed. We hope that you have enjoyed our most recent broadcast, and we'd like to remind you it is within you to deprogram your mind and liberate yourself from the manipulation that takes place every day through the system of mind control. Knowledge is power, and it can help to eliminate fear. We thank you for joining us on this journey to free those minds that are currently being distracted and to empower the spirit of all members of the human family. We hope that you share this important message with others as this journey is yours. Together we can remember who we really are and breathe new life into that which they have worked so hard to program, our world. By remembering who we are and our true significance, we can learn to love ourselves and create the harmony we wish to see in the world, free from all fear and control. Please visit us again next week to listen to another unique perspective that we hope aids in the knowing and protecting of your rights. Love yourself. We love you. Thank you for tuning in, and take care of you for us. We're with you. <laughs>